Good morning. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for being part of our program. The only thing we desire is to focus you on Jesus. Because we know that once your focus is on Him, everything else in your life will fall into place, every other problem will fall into perspective, and you'll begin to see beautiful changes. We want you focused on Jesus. Now let's focus on Jesus for a few minutes from Mark chapter 8 and first of all the opening 11 verses. Let me read the incident to you. And as I read it, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Because you see, when we're open to the Spirit, He says different things to us. He reveals one thing to you and something else to me. So let's hear what God is saying. During those days, another large crowd gathered since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they'll collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 men were present. Having sent them away, he got in a boat and went across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, let's go back and see what's happening. First of all, I wonder what you heard as I read that. Here were these people, and they'd been with Jesus, and they'd had nothing to eat. And that beautiful sentence comes out in verse 2, I have compassion for these people. That feeling that Jesus had where he felt what the other person felt. I don't know about you, but how often I long for that. I just long to feel what the other person feels so that I can help them. And I know, and I guess it's true of you too, the times when I've been so insensitive to what the other person feels. Of course, on the other hand, you do find that some people are terribly sensitive. And even when you don't mean something, they're feeling something. Or they're sure you're thinking something. Well, of course, when you get to that point, I think you have to give it back to the Lord. But here's Jesus looking at this great crowd, and he had compassion. But why did he have compassion? Well, I think it's fascinating. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. These people had spent three days listening to Jesus. You know... When I read this, I really had to smile. Some of us have been in church for about 15 minutes, and we begin to think about lunch, and we begin to picture lunch, and where we're going to have it, and what we're going to eat, and we can hardly wait for the service to be ended because we're so hungry, which of course is not true. What is true is it's the time that we normally eat, and our stomach gives us a nudge. But can you imagine being there three days and they'd had nothing? So listen very carefully to this. And next time you come into church and you find your mind's heading for food, time to start praying and covering your mind with the blood of Jesus and getting back on track. And don't blame the preacher all the time for it. It may well be you and not him or her. Be sure you're listening to what's being said to you by the Lord. And let's get off this whole picture of what's happening at home. I remember in England it was even worse. Because we had our midday meal as the big meal of the day. And you could sit in church and you could look at the preacher and you could see a roast in the oven. Then you had problems. And you had to, as it were, and the Quakers say this, you had to center down on what was going on. So here are these people. Three days without food, and Jesus is concerned. Now, he's concerned, and again, very practical. He says, if I send them home hungry, they'll collapse on the way, because some of them have come a long distance. Well, of course, he's right, isn't he? If they hadn't eaten for three days, and they start walking and really giving out energy, some of them would faint.
And that's Jesus being practical again. I just love it. It flows all through the gospel stories. You remember when he fed the 5,000, he sat them down in groups. There was an orderliness about it. They then knew how many were there, and they were able to serve them. You'll always find the practical coming through with Jesus. Be sure, as one of Jesus' own people, that you're as practical as he was. Remember the man who was deaf and dumb, took him aside, got him away from the crowd, and then prayed for him so that the sounds weren't too much. Very practical. Here he is again. Don't let them go home hungry. They're going to collapse on the road. Well, what are we to do about it? Well, of course, there's a beautiful thing. His disciples responded as you and I would. Where in this remote place can we get enough bread to feed them? They were being practical too, but they were forgetting it was Jesus. Notice his reply. How many loaves do you have? All our God wants to know is what you've got for him. It's not how much you need. You see, God is into multiplication. What he wants us to do is to present him with what we have. None of us have enough for what we need to do, but we don't have to. We have to have the willingness, and God will do the rest. And he does it, and he does it beautifully. Go to him, take him what you've got, and say, Lord, this is yours, and here rejoice and begin to use it. How many, how much do you have? What have you got? We got seven loaves. Well, bring them to me. So they bring the seven loaves to Jesus. And you know what happened. He just lifted them up to the Father and said, thank you. Thank you for what? Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do. Isn't that a neat prayer? Again, it's awfully brief, isn't it? He just thanked him and immediately began to break the loaves and give them to the disciples. And then he found they had some fish and he did the same thing. Lifted up in a thanksgiving prayer and began to give it to the disciples. And then Mark puts in that lovely word. And they ate and they were satisfied. Everyone had enough. Didn't need any more. They had all been fed. That's our God. That's our Jesus. And you see, because there's a creative power here, he can start with very little and multiply it into plenty. Just as when he began this world, he took nothing and made something. That is the power of our God. Inexplicable. If you stop and analyze this parable, there is no way intellectually to understand it. It simply doesn't make sense. But whoever told you that the Lord our God would make sense? Our God does his own thing. And he can multiply. And if he can multiply bread and he can multiply fish, he can multiply things in your life. Your ability, your talents, the spiritual gifts he's given you, whatever it is, the Lord our God will multiply it and use it to his glory. What we have to do is to take what we are willingly to him and say, Lord, I'm yours. Use me to your praise and glory. And he will. Now we go on to something rather different. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got into the boat and crossed to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The Jews always wanted a sign for proof. And you see, Jesus is saying, you don't need any proof. There are signs all around you. Remember, his ministry had gone on for some time. Why did they want some special sign? And you will find that people are no different today than those Pharisees. Give us a sign. Show us. Well, we don't need to. You observe the life and you know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If someone's living with Jesus you see a difference. You see the love. You see the peace. You see the sensitivity. You see Jesus coming through. What do you want to sign for? Are you a person of signs? Are you one of these who needs the experiences? You don't need to do that. And Jesus would not do it for these Pharisees. And it's interesting, isn't it? He said no sign will be given, and he just turned around and walked away and left them. And I imagine left them speechless. What are they going to do? They wanted a sign, they didn't get one. And exactly the same thing happened with King Herod. When Jesus was having those judgments with Pilate, he sent to King Herod, and all Herod wanted was to see a sign. He wanted to see some miracle. And Jesus never even spoke, never said a word. 
There wasn't anything to say. And you see, the wonderful thing about Jesus is that he could choose the right time to speak and the right time to keep silent. And with King Herod, you just didn't say anything. There was nothing to share, so Jesus didn't share it. He just kept quiet. Same with these Pharisees. There's nothing to say. Their question is absolutely useless. So he just leaves it. We need to learn from Jesus the times to speak and the times not to speak. So he gets in the boat and he goes across to the other side, the Sea of Galilee, and leaves them. They knew very well. They were seeing signs all the time. But they wanted more. And that may be true for you. We can see signs today. We can see signs of God's presence and God's power. He's moved across this nation. Now the strange thing is this. Because it isn't news, we don't see it on television, we don't read it in our newspapers, they will never publicize what the Lord our God is doing. Sometimes because they don't understand, and secondly because they're not going to give him any credit. I really believe that when we get to heaven, we're going to find people were healed, who went for operations and when the surgeons found it, they could find nothing to do. I think they opened some people up and God's already been there and healed. We had an incident that was very fascinating recently. One of our ladies went for a hysterectomy because of a lump. And when the surgeon was going to operate, bless his heart, she was ready for the operation. He said, I feel I should just take another x-ray. Or he did another test. And he found it wasn't necessary. God had already been there and done the healing. The operation that was going to be was cancelled. And I thank the Lord for the honesty of that doctor who had the courage to check himself out and found that God had done his work. I believe God is continually working like this. And we often don't see the signs and the miracles, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to pray faithfully. We're here to help those who need help. We're here to show the love of Jesus. And what happens is the affairs of Jesus, not ours, and we can rejoice with him because he's working in wonderful ways in this generation.